Okay, so that's sort of the background I had promised on vulnerability in general and then talking a little bit about the different types, the categorical and comparative claims regarding vulnerability. Now what I want to do is to think more about protections, I want to think about a very specific case which is with regard to informed consent, people who can't give informed consent. And the reason why I pick this one amongst all the vulnerabilities that we've talked about so far is that informed consent is one of the most important protections. It's one of the most common, it's one of the most important. It's not the only one. As Christy mentioned to you, there are a number of very important ones. Independent review is very important. But informed consent is common and it's important. And therefore, when we're doing research with individuals who can't give informed consent, we have a particularly vulnerable case. But again, there's context dependence here as well. There are some, there's some research studies for which you don't even require informed consent. And if you don't require informed consent, then the fact that somebody can't give informed consent might not make them vulnerable because you don't even think you need informed consent in that case. So again, even for this one, even though it's very important, you still see that there's some context dependent. Some cases in which even maybe being unable to give informed consent doesn't necessarily make a subject vulnerable. All right, so here's a quick example. This is a case I was involved in about 10 years ago. This is one of my favorite examples for thinking about this. This was a woman who was a um, very educated, intelligent, but now retired government worker who has brought the NIH for evaluation of her memory by her husband. Her husband reports over the last couple of months that things that she had seen very capable of doing her entire life, they'd been married for 40 years, she was no longer able to do with facility, and in some cases she wasn't able to do it at all. And he started getting worried about her. So it turned out that there was a team here that was doing a three-week inpatient evaluation. Basically, this was a group of geriatric psychiatrists who were looking at various kinds of memory problems in the elderly, various kinds of dementia. And what they did was they brought people in, had them in-house for three weeks, and did a number of different procedures and tests with them. So MRI is MRI scans, right? Uh, LP is lumbar punctures. Basically, you put a needle into the spinal column down in the back, try to get some cerebral spinal fluid to look at what's going on in the fluid that's bathing the person's brain. There's some blood studies, some psychological studies and behavioral testing, a lot of tests being done on computers, reaction time, memory, and things like that. So that's basically what the goals were in the procedures of the study. Um, at baseline, Ms. P wasn't sure where she was. She wasn't sure when it was. MMSE is her mini mental status exam. It's a, an exam of basic cognitive function. And 11 is not very good. It goes up to 30. Even on a bad day, I get a 25. On a really bad day, you probably get at least a 20. 11 means somebody's having fundamental problems with a number of different areas of their cognition. So I actually talked to Ms. P. We were, the team was worried about her and wondered whether or not it would be appropriate to enroll her in a study. So they asked me to talk to her. So I explained that she was being invited to participate in a research study. And one of the things that's always most important to me, particularly in a case like this, where it's largely what I call non-beneficial research. This wasn't research that was going to directly benefit Ms. P. These weren't procedures. They weren't doing the blood studies. They weren't doing the MRI to try to clinically help her. It was to try to collect data for longer-term research studies. So I explained to her a number of ways, a number of different times, that this research wasn't intended to benefit her at all. It was a matter of her undergoing these procedures to try to help them learn more that hopefully would help us in the future. So I asked her, and then I said, well, what do you think about this? She looked at me. She was smiling. She was very pleasant. She was engaged. And she said, yeah, of course I want to be in this study. This is just such a lovely, this is just such a lovely place. Now, it's more indication of Ms. P's mental status at the time. This was a standard clinical room with some really, I thought, kind of ugly posters on the wall. And the fact that she thought it was pretty probably was worrisome. And of course, that doesn't seem like the reason why you want somebody to make a decision to be in research or not. And presumably what was going on here, as happens with a lot of people like this, she was just deflecting. She didn't understand the study. She didn't necessarily want to reveal that to me. So she was just turning her attention to something else, the paintings that are actually on the wall behind me that she was able to talk about. 
So I was confident no one was forcing her to do this. It was up to her, and she was saying yes, but it was clear that she didn't understand. She understood some things, but just very minimally. She didn't understand the vast majority of the study. She certainly didn't understand that the procedures were being done to collect data to help patients in the future. So here's a case in a context in which informed consent isn't going to get us the protections we want simply because this subject can't understand what she needs to understand to give informed consent. So what do we do about that? So quick background on the U.S. regulations. As I mentioned, U.S. regulations, there's what's called subpart A, the general protections for research. Those largely focus on two things, informed consent and IRB review. And then there are subparts for extra protections for vulnerable subjects, B, C, and D. And those apply to these categories I have here. The first one is pregnant women, fetuses, and neonates. The next one is prisoners. And the third one is children. So the important point for today's purpose is right now that there's no additional protections for people like Ms. P. There's no additional protections for non-emergency research with adults who can't give informed consent beyond getting the permission or the agreement of an appropriate surrogate, what's called in the regulations a legally authorized representative or an LAR. So a couple of things about how we handle cases like this. The first thing is this is the buzzword in doing evaluations of consent, which is task specificity. And the idea here is that whether or not somebody can understand something and give consent to it obviously depends upon what that thing is. Some of us can understand certain things, and we can't understand other things. So the first point of that is that although things like a mini mental status exam and IQ test, general tests of cognition can be valuable in certain settings, typically they're not going to tell us whether or not somebody can consent to a specific study. The way we figure out whether or not somebody can consent to a specific study is we explain that study to them and see if they can understand that particular study. That's the task specificity of it. And there are at least two ways in which somebody might not be able to give informed consent. They might not be able to understand. That was the challenge with Ms. P. Or they might not be able to give a voluntary decision. That was the challenge, remember, a minute ago with Maki, who worked in a lab. It was a worry about whether or not, if the PI was her boss, whether or not that would undermine her ability to make a voluntary decision whether to enroll. So different axes here that we need to pay attention to. Another point is in terms of timing. Typically, when you hear talks like this, people focus on initial enrollment, the point at which the person first enters a study. That makes sense. That's an important point. But it's also useful to remember that somebody might be able to give informed consent initially, and then they might lose consent capacity for various reasons. They have dementia that progresses. They get an acute episode. They get drugs that make them paranoid for a moment, various reasons why they might lose capacity after they've already enrolled. So one of the examples here is hydrosteroids, which can lead to temporary decisional incapacity, at least in some people. So what do you do? How do investigators handle this? So the idea is what you're supposed to do is empower yourself, empower your team, everybody you work with to be sensitized to whether or not the people who are being considered and the people who are being enrolled and, as I just mentioned, the people who are already participating, whether they understand, whether they continue to understand, and they continue to make a voluntary choice about being in a study. And then when there's worries, that person can be evaluated either by the team or, if need be, independently. A number of instruments have been developed. I did a review of this a little while ago, about 10 years ago for different instruments to evaluate understanding. There are some formal instruments. There are what I call post-consent quizzes, where you just describe the study to the person and then quiz them afterwards. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. So different ways you can evaluate understanding. Voluntariness is harder. There aren't as many instruments that have been developed. There are no formal instruments that I know about. Paul Applebaum, who is a psychiatrist who's now at Columbia has done some of the best work on this, thinking about how do we evaluate voluntariness in the context of both clinical care and also clinical research. So absent a formal instrument or a formal test, here's one of the ways we try to do it. Is so you just try to ask people, 
and try to get some description from them of what their thinking process is, what the reasons are, what the factors that they regard as impinging on their decision to enroll. You can just ask them, why do they want to be in the study? What makes them think that this would be a good idea? What do they think that other people think about being in the study? What do they think the doctors would do if they said, no, they didn't want to be in the study? What do they think their family would do if they said they didn't want to be in the study? So asking a number of questions in various ways to try to see whether or not there are any, any well, try that again, inappropriate pressures being placed by others on this person to make a decision either to enroll or not to enroll in the study. So here's a sample quiz. I'm on the IRB for the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And what our IRB does is we require for every study that we approve, there has to be a post-consent evaluation to ensure that the people who enroll in our studies understand them and are making a decision based on that understanding. This is just a kind of example of the sorts of quizzes that people get asked. What will happen to you if you decide to be in this study? What are the risks? What would happen if you decide you didn't want to be in the study? So do they realize that they won't face any penalties if they decide not to? What are the chances of benefit? Do they have a realistic appreciation for the chances of benefit? Alternatives are always crucial to make sure somebody understands what alternatives they have to being in a study. And then to try to get a sense for the decision making, which we're not going to talk about that much today, you just ask them, OK, so you have these other alternatives. You could go home. You could go see a clinical doctor. You could get surgery. Why is it that you're interested in enrolling in this study rather than doing one or more of those other things and get the person to talk their way through it to get a sense for how they're reasoning and how they're making this decision? So now we've evaluated this person. And with Ms. P, she clearly was not able to give informed consent because she was not able, as I mentioned, to understand enough. So what do we do with people like that? How do we protect them? Clearly, then, she's a vulnerable population, given, as I mentioned, the importance of informed consent. Here's the Nuremberg Code, one of the most influential codes in the history of clinical research. First principle. Informed consent is, quote, absolutely essential to ethical research. Well, if you take that seriously, that seems to suggest that if a person can't give informed consent, they shouldn't be in research at all. And what we do then is we say, OK, with people like Ms. P, the way we're going to protect them is we're just going to exclude them from all studies, no matter what type of study it is. This obviously offers very important protection from being harmed, being exploited, or being taken advantage of in the context of clinical research. But it also raises a concern. If we exclude everybody like Ms. P from research, if we exclude every four-year-old from research, if we exclude every unconscious person from research, it's going to make it very hard, if not impossible, to develop improved treatments, medicines, interventions for those individuals and for those groups. And what that leads to is then a balance. We need to see, can we figure out a way to get sufficient protection for individuals like Ms. P without absolutely categorically prohibiting research with her so that we can at least make some progress on the kinds of conditions that lead to these cognitive impairments in the first place. All right, that's the challenge. Here's one way to think about the challenge. One way to think about the challenge, why are we worried about Ms. P? Here's one way to think about it. The worry is she now has some process going on in her brain, and that process is making it very difficult for her to understand important aspects of our study. And the worry is we don't want it to be the case that she enrolls in the study because that process is clouding her judgment. We don't want to take advantage of the fact that she doesn't understand. Now, if that's the right way to think about the worry, I, do, I think that is the right way to think about the worry. We can talk about it if people see other worries. But for me, that's the primary worry. We don't want to take advantage of or exploit her lack of understanding. So how do you do that? Well, what you want to make sure is you want to make sure that enrollment is consistent with her preferences and values. So <coughs> excuse me, even if she could understand, what would she say then? Imagine that. And if the answer is even if she could understand, she'd say yes, then we can be at least relatively confident we're not taking advantage of her inability to understand. That raises this question. One of the things I try to do here is try to identify places where coming up with empirical data would be helpful 
to identifying, evaluating, and resolving some of the ethical issues we face in clinical research. So here, we're worried about what I'm calling unwanted enrollment. Enrolling people in research they wouldn't have wanted to enroll in if they'd been able to make their own decisions. One way to try to get a grasp on that is to ask the question and collect data on what do people think about enrolling in research if they become incapacitated? Is it something people are willing to do, not willing to do? So here's a couple studies I'll give you. This is a study we did about 12 years ago with some investigators here. And these were people who were at risk for Alzheimer's disease. So basically, these were first degree family members of people who had been diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease, an important group for thinking about future cognitive impairment and research. And what we found out is that, at least in this group, this group was pretty motivated. A lot of them were willing to be in research, even if they lost the ability to make their own decisions. Another example, this was a follow-up I did with a summer student we had here. And this was looking not at hypotheticals. This wasn't what people indicated in a hypothetical questionnaire. This was actually the choices that people indicated on their advanced directives that they filled out here at the clinical center. And what we found out is some people said, I don't want to be in research. And these are people who come here who tend to be pretty motivated with respect to enrolling in research. So that's important. Some people, even motivated people, don't want to be in research if they become unable to make their own decisions. But a lot of other people did. If the research was minimal risk, a lot of people were willing. If it was more than minimal risk, not as many, but still some people willing to be in the studies. These were data that were confirmed about five years ago by my now colleague Scott Kim, who's a psychiatrist. And he was doing a follow-up from a survey of older Americans. And this is a subsample of the survey. And basically what he found here are the numbers that, again, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people are willing to be in research even if they lose the ability to give informed consent. And as the prior study suggested, not surprisingly, the willingness to be in research if you lose capacity, that willingness goes down as the risks go up and goes down as the potential benefits go down, as you would expect it. As the risk-benefit profile becomes less favorable, people are less willing. As it becomes less risky, people are more willing. So that's what this suggests. It suggests that there's this tracking between the type of research. People don't have categorical views. Some, some are willing to be in no research. A very few are willing to be in almost anything. But most people are tracking the risk-benefit and the value of the particular studies. So then the question is, OK, if that's general willingness across at least the US population, this is just data from the US, I should mention. What does that mean about how we can implement safeguards? This challenge I mentioned of trying to figure out safeguards we can implement to allow this research but conduct it in an ethically appropriate way. 